Praise the Lord. All right, you ready for the word? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you that it is sharper than any two-edged sword and that it just cuts and heals and ministers to us. And I just pray that we receive with open hearts this morning in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. We've been in, uh, two weeks ago, we were in Matthew chapter 9, uh, and, and really for a few weeks. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. And and we looked at Jesus doing some one-on-one witnessing. Remember with the lady at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. And, and, you know, he could have avoided her. He could have gone around. Most Jewish people would have avoided her and not even gone around that area. But he didn't avoid the outcasts. Let me tell you something. Jesus loves the outcasts. That's good for us, right? Because a lot of us, we're all outcasts, one way or the other. And uh, she was an outcast. That's why she was there in the middle of the day getting water. <clears throat> and she expected rejection from Jesus. Any good Jewish man would have rejected her. But you know what? <clears throat> Our Jesus doesn't reject. He accepts and he brings in and he transforms. And so... So many times we'll be sent to people. God will send us to people like that guy I was talking about. <clears throat> that guy, and, and he expected rejection from the Christian Bible school student. But you know what? I got to tell him about a Jesus that loved him and didn't compromise. But you know what? Can transform and redeem and save and set free. Amen? That's my Jesus. Amen? And I love how Jesus, it, it, you see it everywhere he goes where it doesn't matter how contaminated that person is, how unclean that person is ritualistically or whatnot, because you can't get Jesus dirty. He bore the sins for us once on the cross and conquered death, hell, and the grave. And you know what? We can come to him with whatever, and we can't contaminate Jesus. We get clean when we go to Jesus. And that's true for the leper. It's also true for the liar. It's true for the person that's got whatever issues or whatever sin or whatever fear or whatever stuff, we bring it to Jesus and he cleanses us from salvation to every little thing. Just get to Jesus. You know what was really cool the other day? We were in here and and we were working. And when I say like we were working, I was watching Richard work. (laughs) And and, uh, there was a couple of guys, some guys out there, they were doing some uh, stuff for the telephone poles. And I told them they could come in and use the restrooms, and there was a guy right out this door, and uh, and we could smell him, because he he smelled like a like a weed factory. You know, he was like it was strong. It was we're like what is? And then I see him out there, and I'm like, hey, do you need to use the restroom? And he started to come in, and he's like, oh no, you know what? I can't because I've been smoking smoking marijuana. And I said, I said, you know what? And I just, I was looking at Richard, and I was like, you can't contaminate Jesus, you know? And, like, he did not feel accepted and free to come to Jesus. See, people always try to, this is like the classic. They try to fix themselves before they get to Jesus. And Christians do it, too. We do it all the time. But, and I, I'm like, listen, it doesn't work that way, you know what? And, and, and I couldn't get him to come in which made me sad, but I, he let me pray for him, and I prayed for his deliverance, and I showed him love, and I said, you're always welcome in this place, and if he came in smelling like that, okay, be all right, we'll survive. <laughs> if you come in one Sunday morning, and it smells like a wacky tobacco factory, I promise it wasn't me, <laughs> but I might have been a witness to somebody, and you know what? So, you know, but that's the thing, man. We got to just not be afraid because we can't contaminate Jesus. He just cleanses. So he revealed that who he was to the Samaritan lady and, and the whole city came out. And that's when Jesus says, look, the harvest is plentiful. I love that picture, man. Just seeing them coming over the hills. You see, I can see it in my mind, this whole crowd walking out. And he's like, don't say we got the day off, guys, because don't say there's four months left of the harvest because... It's right there. Because that was their day off, by the way. That was their day off. And, and, and he said, 
Hey, here's the harvest. And they're like, oh, okay, here goes Jesus again. <sighs> All right, get ready. And he preached and shared and got hope to these people that were lost and outcast. And that's one thing I just, one of the many things that I just love about our Jesus. Amen? So today I want to talk to you about another witnessing story from the book of Acts. And it's a great one. It's the story, the account of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. How many have ever heard of those two guys? You know, a little bit. I'm going to give a little background to the story there. First, <clears throat> I want to talk about Philip's backstory. He was one of the seven guys chosen to wait tables. Remember when Stephen, remember when Peter was saying, hey, I don't want to stop preaching to wait tables because the widows were not getting enough in the distribution. So they said, pick seven guys who are good guys, good character, and love the Lord, and pick seven guys to just be in charge of the food pantry. That was his job, and Stephen was one of those guys. Stephen was martyred, remember, when they laid the clothes down at Saul's feet, and he was stoned. And then <clears throat> Philip was one of those guys. He was one of the seven. And Acts 6, 5 says, And they said, They pleased the whole gathering. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith of the, and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip. Now, I'll say this, being in the ministry of helps does not mean we don't preach. Now, say, I'm not called to be an evangelist. Well, maybe not as an official calling, but we're all called to testify of Jesus. No believer is off the hook for that. We could do it in different ways, don't have to do it the same way, but we're all called to share our faith. Now, Philip eventually fled Samaria after Stephen was murdered. He fled. He took off because he, they were going to kill him. Just like a lot of people, they fled, and they went to different regions. And so we pick up the story in Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went out to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. And they heard him, and they saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirit, spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame or healed. So there was much joy in that city. So he flees. There's persecution. He flees, goes to Samaria, Samaria and we talked about that last time. And it's going good. It's going good. People are getting saved, paralyzed, people getting healed, signs and wonders. I mean, it's, it's going really good. Now, let me tell you this, too. I'm not discouraged by what I see in the world. As a believer, I see a world that's looking pretty bad. Bad stuff's happening. This, I mean, we could face serious persecution, right? Now, does John like suffering? Nope. No, John doesn't like hangnails, splinters, and definitely John doesn't like, you know, persecution. John doesn't like going to the dentist. Oh, that's the worst. How many hate the dentist? I go to the dentist, I lay there, and I'm thinking, all right, this is practice for not denying Jesus. <laughs> you know, that's what I think. I'm laying there, I'm like, oh, I hate the dentist. And so, but here's the thing. Persecution is great for the gospel. I'm sorry. I wish it was like easy times were great for the gospel, right? Because that would be awesome. But persecution, they fled. He fled, but he didn't stop preaching. He was preaching Jesus in Samaria, and things were happening, and they were moving. So it's good for the harvest. So if you're scared, don't be scared. Trust Jesus. He's got this under control, right? Because if the world's crazy, he, he didn't step out. He's not on his phone, right? You know, someone's not paying attention. They're on their phone. Jesus is not on his phone. He knows what's going on. He's got a plan. Amen. Amen? So don't be afraid. All right, a little more about Philip. 18 years later, Paul stayed at his house. So in Acts 21a, on the next day, uh, he departed and came to Caesarea, <clears throat> and we went and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven. That means one of the seven uh, uh, deacons that was in charge of the food distribution and stayed with him. And then in verse 9, it says, He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied while they were staying for many days. A prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. So you remember that time when Paul was going back to Jerusalem? Agabus gave the prophecy with the belt and the hands tied. He was, he was at Philip's house. So Philip is a guy, you know, you don't really know much about him, but he's all there throughout Acts and stayed. His, his kids were serving the Lord, so that's great. Uh, so that he was a faithful, strong 
a uh, follower of Jesus, an evangelist. All right, so the Ethiopian eunuch, let me give you a little bit about him. Uh, he was actually probably not, he's not from the Ethiopia like we have nowadays. It's a, that's a different Ethiopia. Uh, it's actually probably from Sudan, which was called Kush back in the day. And so he's from that region south of Egypt. And um, oh, I'm just moving here, skipping that. All right, oh, and, and like Candace, Queen of the Ethiopians, that actually probably, her name wasn't Candy. It probably, that was just a title. So like, because uh, there was many Candaces, Queens of the Ethiopians, so that's like Pharaoh or Caesar, kind of like along those lines. He was wealthy. Uh, now, he was the first Gentile to receive Jesus that we have documented. See, a lot of people will say Cornelius, but being an Ethiopian and happening in verse 8, chapter 8, instead of, what, 10? He was the first Gentile to come to the Lord. So he was likely also not a convert to Judaism. And why? Because he was a eunuch. And so they couldn't convert and become a full Jew because they were eunuchs. And so they were not allowed. Now here's kind of a fun fact. Is <clears throat> as, as a eunuch and Gentile, when he went to the temple to worship, so he would have been like a God-fearer is what they would have called him meaning he was interested in God, but could only go so far. You follow me on that? Okay? And, then, and so when he went to the temple, he could only go into that very outer court. That's what Jesus cleansed. Remember when Jesus whipped all the guys and said, get out of here? And so the reason why that matters and that's important is because when, when the Jewish people went there to worship the Lord, it wasn't a big deal to have that flea market out front. In fact, it made it easier for them because they could buy their pigeons and their lambs and their stuff and do their trading, and they could do all of that on their way in, right? All right, pay attention. This is, this is going to make sense to you. They were worshiping. It made it easier for them to do their reli religious obligation, but it made it harder for the Gentiles. It made it harder for the people that they were called to reach. Because they went in there, and they're trying to pray, and they're trying to worship the Lord, and this is, this is there's a wall here, and that's as far as they can go. And this guy's like, pigeons! I got pigeons over here! And this guy's selling lambs, and, and they're trying to pray, and it's like... And Jesus was like, no, y'all getting out of here. And he took the whip two times, and he whipped them, and he got them out, and he said, this is the house of the Lord. This is a place of worship. And I believe he was so zealous because he wanted to reach more people. For us... May we never be a place that is just about what we're comfortable with, what we like, what makes it easy for us to go to church. May we choose what might be a little bit more challenging. We might have to go down the road and buy our lamb so that we can reach the people that can't come in any other way. How about that? Amen? All right, so let's get to the text. <clears throat> Chapter 8, verse 26 now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go to the south, to the road that it goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And, and so he went down there. And now keep in mind, things are going really great in Samaria. He's casting out demons, people getting saved. He's got this great ministry. He's probably well known, all of this stuff, right? And then God says, hey, I want you to go to the desert where there's nobody around. And he didn't say why. So Philip's like, all right, you know, rational thing would be to stay here. Let's keep doing this. This is God. This is, are you paying attention? This is going here. This is going great. You want me to go there? This is like, it's like, nope, I got this covered. I need you over here. Okay? See, sometimes God is going to have us do things that don't readily make sense to us. But you know what? He's got a plan. Amen? So verse 27, he rose and went. And then there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come down to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. So now he's over in Gaza, which you know where that is. You've probably seen it on the news. It's the southwest part of Israel. He's on his way out. He's almost to Egypt and about to take a left and head back to Ethiopia, right? He's almost gone. And God's like, stop what you're doing. Head to Gaza right now. Go down there, and I got something for you. 
and he caught him just on his way out the door. See, let me tell you something. I don't know why nobody told him about Jesus when he was in Jerusalem. I mean, it was pretty well known, right? Remember when the guys were talking to Jesus and they're like, how do you not know what's been going on in the city? It's everybody knows about this, right? And so he went to Jerusalem. Nobody, maybe it was because he was an Ethiopian. Maybe they were only sharing with Jews. I don't know. But he's now on his way out the door. He's about to be gone. This is the last chance. See, we never know when it's our last chance to share the gospel with somebody. I had a good friend in Ecuador, and he was a soul winner. And he told me one time he had a friend he was witnessing to, and God told him to tell him strong. He's like, you need to receive Jesus. You need to receive Jesus. And the guy refused, hopped on his motorcycle, and died on the corner. I wish the story was he got saved. But imagine how he would have felt had he not even shared the gospel with him. And at least given him. Sometimes we're that last exit. We're the last person on the road to say, you know what? Come on. Come to Jesus. And many times God will do that. And like this Ethiopian, he'll turn and find grace. Amen? So, and the Spirit said to Philip, he says, go over and join his chariot. Now, think about it for like a second, right? So, this guy's not like traveling by himself in a chariot. He's in charge of the queen's money. He's got guards. He's got an entourage. He's got a whole setup here. This is like a caravan, right? And so, God's like, go ahead, go right up to that. Imagine like being in like D.C. and you see like a, some kind of like official presidential limo and a bunch of security cars and stuff like that. God be like, hey, go, go talk to the guy in that limo. Would you go, like, knock on the window? <laughs> right? You would expect Secret Service to throw you down to the ground, face plant in the dirt, you know, they'd be like, code 55, you know. I don't know, what's the, I don't know. I can't think of any good codes. They'd be like, Eagle One is down. Eagle One, I don't know, something. But they would say something. They would shove your face in the ground. That's what you would expect, right? If I went up to a chariot and he's got guards and he's got money and some, like, just random dude comes jogging up, hey, you know. You would expect something to happen, right? So, so Philip trepidatiously, cautiously, no, no, no. It says he ran. See, God spoke to him, and he's like, okay, let's go, let's go. He ran and obeyed the Lord. You want to be a soul winner? Don't be hard to lead. See, so many times as Christians, we're, we're like, okay, Lord, all right, well, mm, uh, maybe, are you sure? I remember once when I was young in the Lord and I was, I was uh, working with a coworker. we had some downtime, and I felt like maybe I should just use this time to share my faith. And the Holy Spirit was like, and, I, and I, so I said to the Lord, I was like, Lord, if you want me to do this, you know, have the person say something about the Bible or something. You know, I, I gave God like a little, a little thing for him to do. And, uh, and you know what he said to me? And he'd done that before. Like, he's given me signs for stuff like this, right? And this time, though, you know what he said? It was, I don't remember the exact words, but it felt like this. It felt like, uh, no, no, dude, just do it. We're past that, right? And he wants us, see, if we're going to be soul winners, man, we don't need to have a bird come and land on our shoulder and be like, ooh. Whisper, thank you. Tell them about Jesus. You know, no, man, we just, we just got to be like, just go for it. Just run and dive in. We got to be willing to take risks. You know? Listen, don't be afraid to mess up. Make a mistake. Okay? If we make a mistake trying, praise the Lord. Listen, we've made mistakes, I've made mistakes. Going to make some more mistakes. I'm planning on it. I got a, I got a little checkbox. I'm waiting to check it. You know, we're going we're gonna to make some. But you know what? We're going to make it trying to win people to Jesus. I'm not afraid. Because the moment we get afraid to get it not perfect, then we're not going to step out of the boat, man. We're going to wait to see, like, that water stop moving. Like, no, nah, man, just step out. Just go for it. Be brave. Take risks. You know, and, and things, 
So we got to get out of that comfort zone because things were going great in Samaria, but he's like, go down here to this desert place where nothing's going on. You know, we can't judge by what we see either, by just appearances. You know, because he, he looked, he's like, well, this guy ain't going to be interested in Jesus. I mean, if you just look, this is like some rich dude. I'm not dressed right. I didn't bring my right sandals. Oh, man, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, he's got guards. He's got money. He's going to be not wanting me to interrupt him. You know, we can look. So many times we look and we make a, we decide if that person is ready for Jesus or what, right? Have we ever done that? We're like, well, that person is. There's this, there's this lady, she's like this world-renowned tattoo artist. She was a self-proclaimed witch. Media influencer. Her name is Kat Von D. And like, <clears throat> I think recently she just, I don't really know anything about her, <clears throat> but recently she posted a video of her water baptism. And how many have seen that? A few of you see that? Okay. And she, she got baptized. And, and you know what's kind of a little bit sad about it is like some Christians being like social media, some, uh, you know, keyboard warriors for Christ. Be like, that's fake. You're just doing this for attention and stuff like that. And, well, you don't got this right yet. You're still doing this sin and still doing that sin. Man, she posted her throwing away her witch books. She's been covering her tattoos, and she said, she said, these no longer reflect who I am as a person. I'm sure, I am sure, if you Google her when you get home, you'd be like, whoa, this person, I don't even know if they're a Christian, right? Because she's in process, man. But she, she's in process. And now everybody's watching because she's famous. Man, everybody, imagine if when you got saved, everybody's watching. Hey, when are you going to stop looking at porn, man? Right? Or whatever. When are you going to stop lying or gossiping or whatever, right? Because everybody's watching. Man, you know what? We give this grace to people, and we cheer them on when they come to Jesus. And we pray that they don't falter, and we pray that they make that next step. Amen? Man, I hope somebody like that comes in here. Man, I'll be so excited. You know what was cool? I watched the video of her baptism. It was great. And it's like in an old-fashioned church. And she gets baptized. And they show, like, the audience. And there's, like, all these, like, her friends there that are, like, all covered in tattoos and stuff. And they're, like, not even believers or anything. And they're, like, watching. I'm like, yes. Yes. And people are, like, critical of her husband because he's still not saved. But he goes to church with them. With her, you know, and I'm like, I don't even get that. I don't even get that. I sent a message, you know, Instagram, and I was like, you know what? You be encouraged. I'm sure she won't read it, but I just felt like I wanted to do it. And I'm like, I'm a pastor, and I want you to know, you know, this is, you know, I forget what I said, but be encouraged, and we stand with you, and I'm congratulations on your faith. Amen? <clears throat> so, like, if a, if a transgender guy comes in here in a dress or something, and he's what if he comes in here? How long till he stops wearing the dress? Oh, I'm going there. I don't know. The short answer is, I don't know. When do I say something? You know what? When the Holy Spirit tells me or he, the Holy Spirit tells him or whatever. But you know what I say to everybody else? Chill out, man. Close your eyes and worship Jesus because we want to reach people. Am I going to say it's not a sin? No, it's, it's a sin. It's wrong. But so is fornication. But everyone's cool with that now. All the church people are like, yeah, are we still against that? I can't remember. And all the other sins that nobody sees. Sometimes I know. Like, I could discern certain sin, you know, and I don't say it to the person. I just pray. Trust Jesus. But you know what I find? Like sometimes it comes up. But when it does, I say it in love and encouragement and with redemption in my heart. Because what if that's your kid, man? What if that's somebody you desperately don't want to go to hell? Can we get that heart and just be like, please, I just want you to come to Jesus. 
it's okay if it's messy along the way. Amen? And that's, that was like Philip, man. He's up there, and he's like, I don't know about this guy, but let me just talk to him about Jesus. So Philip ran to him, verse 30, and he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, and he asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I understand unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip. He says, come on up and sit with him. And, he, and in the passage of the scripture where he was reading was this. Ready? This is great. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before his shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. And in his humiliation, justice was denied. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away? Man, I just got, I don't know, man. I don't know why I'm so emotional right now. Let's just pray. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, just, just pray with me for a minute. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just lift up. Lord, all our family members, just stand and pray for your family members right now. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to pray in the Holy Spirit. I don't normally pray in tongues, like in the middle of a service, but uh, it's a gift from the Lord if you don't know about it. And uh, it's the Holy Spirit praying. Thank you, Jesus. Start calling out the names of people you're praying for. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just call out Pat and Tim and Kaylee and Ron. And Lord, I call out Danny. I call out family members, Lord, and, and, and uh, all of them in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I call out Sam in Jesus' name. We proclaim them to be saved in Jesus' name. Send Phillips to them, people that aren't afraid to step out of the boat, people that aren't afraid of how they look, people that aren't afraid of how they act in Jesus' name. Give us all boldness. I pray we become those people. We become those people in the name of Jesus. Give us boldness and faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Ooh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You, you can sit down for a minute. Ooh. So, so he reads this scripture. This guy's ready. I mean, God set him up. God set him up. I think that's pretty great. And then the eunuch even asks, he says, about whom I ask you, does this prophet say this? About himself or someone else? Man, what a setup. I got to love this, man. Give me those kind, Jesus, right? And he says, and then, then Philip opened his mouth and he starts to talk about Jesus. Let me tell you something. It's always about Jesus. It's about Jesus. David and Goliath isn't just about we can conquer Goliath. It's about Jesus already conquered Goliath. It all points to Jesus. Jesus was the lamb that was sacrificed. He was the one that took our place for our sins. He is God in the flesh, and he rose from the grave, conquering death, hell, and the grave so we can have victory, so we can have access to the throne of grace, and so we can spend eternity with him. It's about Christ. Amen? Amen. That's a good place to like give a praise offering right there. Praise the Lord. It's about Jesus. You know, and uh, let's go to the, back to the text, verse 36. It says, and they were going along the road, and they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And, the, and he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Ah, oh, I love that. I just love that, man. Baptism, water baptism is my favorite thing in pastoring. I like it better than an altar call. I like it better than weddings, for sure. And I like it better than, you know, all the preaching, water baptism. It's just so exciting and so powerful when somebody makes that declaration. If you want to be baptized, come see me. Let me know. We'll bring out the tank again, and, and, and we'll baptize you. But it, it's so awesome. And tradition says, and it's not in the Bible, so we don't know for sure, but tradition says that when he went back to Ethiopia, that Candace got saved. And then he went around preaching and created a whole movement in Ethiopia. Isn't that awesome? And they came out of the water, verse 39, they came up out of the water, and the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, 
And the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. And Philip, Philip found himself as Azotus, and, and he passed through, and he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. And that's where he ended up, because that's where Paul found him 18 years later. You know, what I love there is, is how, how God just led him. I mean, first time, he, he sent an angel. So you can't really deny that was the Lord, right? Because when an angel appears, you're like, okay, that's, that's probably God, <laughs> right? You know, unless it's got little horns or something. But, you know, but, you know if it's a real angel, then, yeah, okay, that's God. And then, but then the other time, second time, the Holy Spirit spoke to him, right? And then the third time, nobody spoke to him. God just picked him up and moved him. <laughs> you know, he still does that a different way, though. It's called getting fired from your job. It's called this happening or something changes and we have no control over it. Circumstances beyond our control. God says, okay, I've had God do that to me sometimes. Just stuff beyond my control. And he's like, I'm just trying to get you over here. And I don't know, maybe God needed him there real fast. Like Philip ran for stuff. Like when God told him to do something, he would run. But God's like, you know what? You can't even run that fast. I'm just going to take you. So you know what? Don't worry about it. You're worried, well, if I don't get it, if I can't, if, you know what, listen. Run, and if God needs you faster, he'll take care of it. But when he tells you to do something, do it like with every, heart, every fiber of your being, with all your heart, and go for it. Amen? Amen. If we're going to be a soul winning church, we've got to be a people that are easy to lead. Easy to follow the Holy Spirit. I got, a, I got a buddy like that, and, and uh, we used to be roommates way back in the day. I mean, if the Holy Spirit just tells him, climb that wall and say hallelujah, or, you know, please don't do that while I'm preaching, though, you know. <laughs> but if it tells him, like, on a subway to, to witness to somebody or to do something, he just, he'll just do it, right? He'll just do it. He'll just obey and sometimes he makes mistakes and does dumb things. But then sometimes the person starts bawling and says, yeah, my grandmother died yesterday, and what you said was a word of knowledge. And, you know, man, be easy to lead. That's what he calls us to be. We've got to be willing to look stupid. We will make mistakes. Just ask me about the strawberry fiasco. We did a life church. We did an outreach, and we were giving out free strawberries, Brilliant idea from the pastor. Uh, turns out strawberries don't last very long outside of the fridge. Like, not long at all. So, like, we're passing them out, and this lady comes back. She goes, um, these strawberries are kind of, and she looked, it, it looked like jelly. They were all, like, mushed. And so I was like, oh, no. And then we were, like, trying to pick out the good ones for, like, an hour and a half, and People are coming up and they're driving in to get the free strawberries. Oh, my gosh. Oh, man. I wanted to, like, become an accountant after that. Because <laughs> you know what? We gave some good strawberries to some people. And we did what we did, and then we learned apples. Give them apples. <laughs> <laughs> don't be afraid to make mistakes. And don't be critical of somebody when they make a mistake. Here's, here's the rule of thumb. Like, like somebody gets up and they do some ministry and like kind of they mess up, give them a three days. Give them three days if you have to talk to them about it. Now, you know, I understand there's always exceptions. Like, you know, some things have to be said right away. But three days, that way you pray about it. Maybe it was just you, right? Or me, you know what I mean? And then, but if it still needs to be said, then, then we go ahead and... Now, there are some things that, I'm not saying some things don't have to be addressed right away. You know, sometimes there are things like attitudes and things we need to right away just say, hey, you know. But if we need to bring correction, sometimes we just give it a little bit of time because if they put themselves out there and they just flopped, then we want, to, we want them to be encouraged. Anyway, so that was just a little free bonus there. Uh, we don't judge by appearances. We just listen to the Holy Spirit. Because you know what? God loves them outcasts. He loves the outcasts. You know, whether it's Kat Von D or Saul or the Ethiopian. 
He, as an as a Ethiopian eunuch, he could never become a full Jewish follower of Jehovah. Sorry, never going to happen. But in grace, he can go past that little wall. He can go all the way into the temple. The curtain's ripped, and he can go right into the Holy of Holies. That's a pretty great deal. So all of us with our past and our stuff, we can go before the throne of grace by the blood of Jesus. That's some good news. Amen. So that same good news that is true for us is true for everybody else that don't look like us, that looks different, whether the wrong color, the wrong character, the wrong club, the wrong political party, right? All of them won't contaminate Jesus. Amen? Amen. Fun fact, uh, you know, uh, uh, Philip went on to Azotus, Azotus, I don't know how to say that. You're supposed to just fake it. That's what I learned in preacher school. You just say Azotus. But I, he went on there. There was Ashad in, Ashad in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Fun fact, that was one city that David could never conquer. But Philip went there with the message of Jesus. And they got set free. Sometimes we try to fight, but God wants us to bring grace. And that wins. Amen? Instead of trying to conquer them, we win them. Instead of trying to win over them, we win them to Jesus. Now, let's stand. And you know what? God used regular people. The seven that became famous for the gospel, they were just waiters. They didn't have like an apostolic role, apostolic title. Their title followed who they were. He became Philip the Evangelist because he just was evangelizing all the time. And when stuff, bad stuff happens, he just moved on and kept preaching Jesus. How many want to be like that? Amen. I want to be like that. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just pray. I thank you for a church. I, I believe that this is not something I'm trying to convince people. I think we want, I think everybody here wants to follow you closely, who want to see the way you see, who want to be passionate for souls, and we're going to go there. We're going to go there. We're excited, Lord, for that day. We're excited, Lord, as we continue to reach out ourselves and share your gospel. Just raise your hands and just say, anoint me, Jesus. Anoint me, Jesus, to be one of those laborers for the harvest. Anoint me to be the answer for that prayer for someone else's son and daughter and cousin and brother. Lord, may we be the answer. And then we're going to see it happen for ourselves, to our family members, because you are not mocked for whatever someone sows, that they will also reap. So let's sow for the kingdom, for the harvest. In Jesus' name, we give you praise. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.